okay, he's here. How long? We don't know. We don't know if he's going to just poof. I don't know. Go up in smoke while we're on YouTube, but we have the one and only James Corbett here. Very exciting. Uh, and already the chat Corbett lives. Yes, he does. And <laughs> oh my God, I never thought I'd see James back on YouTube for any reason, which I have to say before we get into the topic today, we were talking before we went live. I do not understand why you are one of the most censored voices on the internet, James. You are the most even keeled, calm researcher, really. I mean, you, you, you seem a lot like if I were to go to a college class in the history of some of these topics, I would just listen to this, this guy. And for yeah. whatever reason, I don't know. Uh, well, you don't know, know either. I, I would say, to be fair, I'm not one of the most censored, but I am censored. And uh, although... I will note for the person who's su surprised to see me back on YouTube in any form ever, I, I, I was surprised, as surprised as anyone, about a month ago, I woke up one day and just noticed, oh, my secondary, my backup YouTube channel was suddenly, poof, was just back. No explanation, no email, no notification of any sort, just suddenly my channel was there. <laughs> and I thought, I have no idea what this means or why it's happening, but I immediately posted a video just to say, I am never ever ever going to post to youtube ever again if you want my work go to corbettreport.com so so that video is there yeah. yeah i'll have to go find that while while you're explaining about the media matrix and we could play it for people at the beginning of it anyway okay so you have this new series out uh the media matrix it's a history basically of mass media it's fascinating people can get it at corbettreport.com corbett with two t's but you already have such a huge fan club. Everybody obviously already knows that. Um, maybe we could first talk about what what do you get out of the media matrix? Like if, if people tune into it, uh, what's the main point? What did you want to get across? Well, that's a that's a great question to start with because I know this is not the sexiest topic and most people are probably not clamoring for, oh, can you please give us some sort of you know history of the media documentary? But I will say I feel very vindicated. One of the comments on the most recent episode episode uh, was somebody saying uh, something to the effect of, you know, I, I, I didn't think I was going to be enjoying this, but actually, wow, this is fascinating stuff. So <laughs> yes, thank you for that, uh, that comment, whoever le left that comment, because I, I know, uh, knowing this information, knowing how it fits into the world that we're living in, and the incredible importance of this topic in particular, not just for the future of of our society, but for the future of humanity itself. I'm not overstating that. I really think the question, the fundamental question of what it means to be human is increasingly being shaped by our media technology. And I'm not necessarily optimistic about what that answer is going to be 20, 50, 100 years from now, given the way things are trending into the metaverse and everything. I think this is a vitally important topic. And like so many of these topics, the more ignorant we are of the history of what has led us here and what it means and the, the sort of the entire the matrix that we are embedded in of various concepts and ideas, the more ignorant we are of that history, the more likely we are to be led along by the nose to this or that into this. And suddenly, oh, now everybody's got the, the, you know, the new Google glasses or whatever it turns mm -hmm. out to be. And why aren't you getting on board? And uh, I, I think it will be uh, to our detriment if we don't know about this history. And and I am also satisfied that, yes, this is an interesting story. Uh, I, I would imagine certainly for most of the people who are in my audience, even if you don't think you're interested in the history of mass media, you will be. <laughs> you will be by the end of this talk, too, because we're going to sell it to you. And here's why. When you were bringing up the the you know, why why would it be important to know where we've come from and and to not repeat it because of that knowledge i actually think even more so a lot of times at least before i started watching your stuff or um you know reading some books on this topic even as somebody who was in mass media i thought i lived in a time and place that was unique not that i don't think i do but what I've gotten out of your videos actually is that these dynamics of power, profit, censorship have been around for the beginning of it. And it's just it's just the medium through which these dynamics are working themselves out that is different in our time and place versus another time and place, like the, the actual medium itself. But the, the dynamics of, of what shapes it and how it's used to control people 
is not is not that different because we often think like, oh my gosh, the news is so biased, the media is so biased, is so you know with censorship and blah. But when I watch your stuff, it's like, oh okay, this this is this is not new. All of the, I mean, literally every single problem that we are facing are problems that have occurred at various times in history. If anything, perhaps the stakes are raised each time because the 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 scope of this communication becomes broader and thereby more and more people are, are affected by it. But ultimately, it's the same dynamics at play, the fundamentally core same dynamics at play as they have been at least since the time of Gutenberg and the invention of the movable type printing press in the mid 15th century. And as, again, I hope people who have seen the first part or first couple of parts of this uh, this series will start to appreciate uh, the, the truly the dichotomous nature of this mass media. It is this incredible tool for connecting people together and uh, spreading information, spreading new ideas, upending old systems and old established hierarchies of control. Uh, freeing humanity, but it's also a potential vehicle for enslaving humanity all, all the more effectively, essentially, by controlling um, what information people are seeing. And that dichotomy, which I think a lot of people understand has existed, certainly in the internet era, it's this wonderful tool for communication, but look at the way it's being used and censored and all of this. But these are the exact same issues that were being faced by people looking at that printing press and the way that printing press revolution started to change the world 550 years ago. It's the same issues at core. It's just, how are they going to play out this time? And since we already know how this script plays out, in a sense, because we saw it happen with the Gutenberg revolution um, being co-opted co co and, uh, and uh, shunted away into what I call the Morgan conspiracy, um, which again is a fascinating little piece of history. But uh, it's this idea of taking this tool for communication and spreading of ideas, consolidating control over that technology in as few hands as possible, and then using it to, to shape people's minds. That's exactly what we have seen in the past couple of decades of the internet revolution. Incredible technology for flowering of human communication and all of this, but now it's being consolidated in the hands of the big tech giants and their um, fascistically related uh, government partners to control the conversation. And it is becoming, it's getting to the point where since 99% of what we get from the outside world is now coming through mediated reality of one sort or another, radio, TV, streaming, whatever it is, then if you don't have a voice in the electronic media, do you have a voice at all? You know, if James Corbett falls mm -hmm. in the woods and no one's there to hear him, does he make a sound, I suppose, <laughs> is the question. And that's that's why I think the stakes, as I say, the stakes are being raised. 550 mm -hmm. years ago, not everyone was writing books or even necessarily reading books. But at this point, everybody has access to this media technology and it's where people get most of their information. Mm -hmm. Do you think also that perhaps we have a false sense of of access, I guess, to information in today's world, whereas, I don't know, you're living five or 600 years ago, it's, at least you're like, I know I live in this little space and I've got this king or this this priest or whatever. And they're in, you know, I know that they're controlling what people think and, and versus now we're like, oh, look, we can find anything. And we don't necessarily walk around with the idea that we have centralized control over it still. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I think this is true in a number of different aspects and facets of our lives, but spe uh, specifically in the media related aspect, we feel that we have access to everything immediately. So I think there is a general sort of feeling amongst the general public who haven't put a lot of thought into this, that yes, we have so much information, yeah, we're, we're good. You know, we don't, everything, everything that anyone wants to say is everywhere. So it, it's fine. We don't have to worry about this too much. Um, and that is to our detriment, but even on a more fundamental level, um, this Media Matrix series that I'm releasing right now is in conjunction with a six and a half hour online media lecture course that I have uh, I, uh, also made available that goes into a lot greater detail on this. And in that course, I really drill down on some of the more philosophical aspects of what's going on here and the way media uh, technology hasn't just changed the way we communicate. Obviously, it does that, but it, it changes the way we think about the world, the way we 
pr process information, what we think about the world. And uh, I, I often go back to Marshall McLuhan, who was talking about these issues 50, 60 years ago in incredibly for, uh, insightful and foresightful ways. I'm um, talking about what the electronic media revolution really means and where it's going and how it's shaping our consciousness. And he talked, for example, about the way the advent of the printed word in uh, the mid 15th century started to mold human consciousness in a certain way. Um, as the population became generally literate, which it didn't need to be pre-printing press, obviously there were people who could write and there were people who could read, but that was not a large percentage of the population. Your average peasant or serf wouldn't have much need for reading and writing in their daily life before the printing press made books widely available. What does that do? The idea of taking information condensing it down into printed words and then putting them in lines on a page conditions us to uh, to uh, understand and process information in a certain way and with a certain lineality that uh, uh, an oral culture, for example, wouldn't necessarily have. There are different ways of speaking, of even thinking about and processing information if you're relating it in audio form than if you're reading it on a printed page. And then once you get into the electronic media revolution, now you're dealing with the idea of, okay, now we're back to some sort of oral culture or visual culture where you're seeing and hearing things, but you're seeing and hearing essentially the electronic ghosts of people far away and potentially even far away in time as well as in space. And what does that what does that do? What does that mean in terms of the way that we start to understand our relationship to the world? In a think about a pre-mediated world back five, six hundred years ago, when essentially 99% or more of the information you received about the world, you got from actual physical tactile experience with that world. But transfer that to, to today, today, where most of the information we have comes from books or TV or or media of some sort. Uh, how does that condition our minds to understand our relationship to the world and what sort of information we take in versus what information we don't? How we learn about the world? Are you more likely, to, if you want to know about something, are you more likely to Google it? Or are you more likely to go out and actually try to experiment or ask someone around you who has experience with it? Probably most people these days are going to Google it. Um, mm -hmm. So again, all of these things shape us and mold us in ways that we like the fish swimming in the water. What's water? What's this water thing you keep talking about? I don't see it. Uh, it can't be that important. No, no, you yeah. don't understand. It's literally everywhere. It is what you are swimming in. In th this case, I think media, it's everywhere. It's what we are swimming in. It's structured our lives in ways we can barely comprehend until we start thinking about it. And once we do, I think people can start to grasp the as I say, the stakes get raised with each iteration of this technology. And now we literally have Zuckerberg trying to get us to strap on the goggles and step into the metaverse. You don't think that's going to change people's fundamental relationship to the world around them and the way they start to process the world? I, I think it will. Mm hmm. Totally. Well, when I right before I was leaving um, my job in TV news, which, by the way, this is one of my favorite parts when and I, it becomes at a perfect time because I was going to ask you about something I learned when I was in seminary. But real fast, when I was finishing up my TV news career, that was the next that was the next thing we were working on was virtual reality. Uh, I remember going through this training. I, it was total waste of a day. I don't even know what I, I was supposed to learn. And we never even used the technology. I don't even think still to this day they are, but they, I'm sure they will eventually, you know, where we had to wear these glasses and we had these trainers come in and teach us about how to use it. And, and yeah. And so it was basically like, how can we bring the news to you as if you're, you're living it, like whatever the story is, you know, you're going to put on these, these glasses and start consuming it as if you were actually there like we were. Um, but to my religion question, um, when I was in seminary and I don't know if this is true, so you can, you can fact check it for me, but a, a lot of times the professors who taught like new Testament or Hebrew Bible, um, talked a lot about how truth was, how, how truth was, uh, seen, I guess, interpreted ver then versus now and had this idea, I guess, that like when you are in an oral tradition, or even if you had a written manuscript, but you had somebody else reading it to you, that you, 
you assumed a different nature of what truth is versus what we do today. Uh, that it was like assumed, I guess, that that there was a filter through which it was coming. It was passed down, uh, you know, it had more tradition. It wasn't as important that something really happened versus its meaning. Like its meaning was more important necessarily than its than the physical reality. Like I said, I could have totally been indoctrinated, but that that's what my professors used to talk about. Is that anything that you came across? Cause as you were, you, you have your Gutenberg uh, video and, and I, I thought a lot about that, that priestly class that tries to censor, you know, after the, the printing press and then you have Martin Luther and his theses and all that stuff. And I've, I've always said that it reminded me a lot of that, that sort of reformation of knowledge because now we have a new priestly class and you, you sort of described it already with the government and the big tech censors and everything. But I'm curious if, if, what you think about that question of truth um, and the truth that sort of passed down before versus now in these, these new media platforms. Um, do we assume a different nature of truth versus the way that people did when it was passed down orally? I, I think there is absolutely something to that. It unfortunately is extremely difficult to tease out the various aspects of what's going on there because in one sense you have the literary traditions of various time and place and cultures. There are different literary tropes and ideas and, and storytelling forms that get passed around at different times. And to some extent that is predicated on the media technology that's available or not available and in the case of pre-literate oral cultures. Surely, yes. And so, for example, if you go back to the, the old Homeric texts or, you know, the Ulysses and things like this, the Odyssey, uh, it's very strange to read them in printed form because there's these, these things that get like these little phrases, the wine dark sea and, and things like this, that get repeated over and over and over and over in different passages. And you, you're, when you're reading it as a printed text, you're thinking like, why, why do they keep repeating these types of set phrases and things over and over and over? It's because you're reading it on a printed page, as opposed to the people who were originally consuming this were hearing it. This was meant to be recited. It was meant to be this thing that was actually probably memorized and passed on from generation to generation for centuries before it was ever put down on paper. And so there are different tropes and different ways of presenting that information. So uh, there is definitely a media aspect to the way that information gets presented. And then uh, in addition to that, there are cultural layers and expectations and things in terms of storytelling. So that, yes, people might in a certain place or a certain culture have the expectation that when they're hearing a story about this figure that went around and did these things, well, are we supposed to think this is literally a, a like when you hear him say something, that's literally a quotation word for word that someone wrote down or is this just, this is what he said, this is the message that he was giving, that kind of thing. Uh, again, there's different expectations that go on. And then, as you say, we in 21st century, looking back at texts that were written a thousand, two thousand longer ago, trying to map our understanding of storytelling onto that, which to some extent has to be shaped and, uh, and molded and formed by our expectation given the media that we have. So we... We look at uh, documentaries on History Channel or whatever, and that is an attempt, sometimes ham-handed, um, but at any rate, it's an attempt to visually represent something authentic, to show this thing happening and to try to get people saying the actual things, the words that they spoke. It's an attempt to try to recreate an actual reality as if someone was walking around with a camera several hundred years ago capturing these scenes on film. Obviously, we know it's fake, it's staged, it's an actor is doing this, but the idea, the impression, the subconscious impression we get is this is a camera mm -hmm. recording of what was happening several hundred years ago. And so that's, I think, the way we, we approach and we take matters that are supposed to be serious, nonfiction, well, this must be an attempt to present the truth as if someone was walking around with a camera or a microphone recording things. But that's not necessarily the context in which people were thinking about this a thousand, two thousand longer ago. They were thinking of it more as these are stories which we sh shape into our lives. So there is, there truly is a difference in the way that we perceive things that uh, that goes on to at least to some extent because of the media technology that's there to represent these things and recreate them for us. I don't think people would have had the ability to, to, to even conceptualize the sort of recorded 
version of history that we have now. Because, of course, we can go back to things that happened 50 years ago and watch the actual footage uh, as they happened and listen to the people saying the exact words that they happened. Obviously, people couldn't have done that several hundred years ago. So they couldn't have even conceived that that existed, that you could record a moment in time and replay it later. Now we take that so for granted that we think, well, everyone must have always thought this is this is what history is. You're trying to get as close to that recording in the room as you can. It, I, there's so many deep, fundamental, philosophical things here that uh, excites me. It's very interesting to me. Um, but unfortunately, again, I think a lot of people don't think about these, th the way the technology has shaped them, themselves. I mean, ultimately, this is about us and how we perceive and conceive of the world around us based on the way that we have uh, been indoctrinated, in, in a sense, into accepting that these this electronic technology is a, a part of the world. Mm -hmm. And I think it's it it definitely, it's a nice experience to even think about trying to, if you tried to live your day, one day of your life without any mediated experience whatsoever, no reading, no listening to anything, you know, only living in the world. What does that look like? What does that feel like? And can you imagine living your entire life that way? How differently mm -hmm. would you, would you be experiencing reality? How would you go about trying to explain your own uh, history or you know things that you know to other people? Would that be shaped by the types of um, uh, experience that you have living in the real world as opposed to well, I read this you know in a book somewhere? Mm -hmm. I have a short answer that I've 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 told people before about when I asked how I started down the path of exiting mainstream media or whatever you want to call it legacy news it really began i think as i was i moved to seattle and i started hiking and i was spending many many hours for the first time in my life in total silence not like you just said not listening to anything not reading anything totally disconnected from media and I, I think becoming comfortable with silence allowed me to become curious about myself and my reactions to media or just to the world around me, people and their thoughts and, and thoughts that I was being exposed to. And because I was taking a pause in that, I it, it sort of gave me some, I don't know, some level of comfort with with self-awareness which i think sometimes can be disconcerting for us when we're used to focusing on events outside of our outside of our, our like really our sphere of even influence like I, now that i'm sort of way down this path i've done the opposite with media that I, I i was doing before whereas now i'm like i don't unless i grow it outside my house or i see it happen i don't really know if i know it actually happened at all, or even if it happened the way that people are telling me it happened. And maybe it did, or probably it did, but there's at least 1% of me that's like, I don't know. And so I've become a lot more focused now on like what's just outside my house or inside my house, you know, my, my, yeah. my child, well, you know, my husband. Well, again, that, that brings up an interesting point related to your previous question as well, is that to some extent, our conception of the truth is again it's it's this idea that if you just had the camera in the room recording things as they were then you would that that's it that's the truth mm -hmm. now you know the truth of this thing that happened but actually the the truth of this this particular thing or this person saying this thing or whatever event you're thinking about is embedded in this incredibly wide context of mm -hmm. all these sorts of things that you can't capture on a camera. You can't capture the political, social context of this statement in this particular way. All you know is these words were said. It, again, assuming you can trust that the audio and video hasn't been tampered with, which at this point we can't trust, right? Because we know mm -hmm. deep fakes are a thing right. and increasingly so from here. But even if we were to disregard that, even if you just have a recording of a thing that happened, does that tell you the truth, the underlying right. truth about that? What what does this statement mean in its context, and how do we how do we process that? So, to some extent, maybe our conception of the truth is limited by this conception that it's just well, it's just a, re a matter of recording sort of what happened, and there there you have the truth. No, 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 no. You have to know 
a million things in order to process that simple, seemingly simple truth. And how do you do that? Now, I want to put out there, because I know some people will interpret what I'm saying as if I am advocating for some sort of neo-Luddidism and we should all just cast off all <laughs> media technology and you know live in the woods or something. I'm not saying that, of course. I'm not advocating what people should or shouldn't be doing. But I really do think we at least should be consciously aware of media and how we use it or how it uses us. And this is an incredibly important point that comes up again and again with McLuhan and Postman and other people who have talked about this. You can you can go out there with the intention of, okay, I'm going to I'm going to read this book in order to learn this thing. I'm going to watch this TV show to be distracted and laugh for half an hour, and then I'm going to go back to my reality. But the the media itself is shaping us and our our habits, our opinions, even the way that we think about the world in ways that we're not always aware of. So um, one example of that that I always point back to because I think he phrased it so beautifully in Neil Postman's uh, Amusing Ourselves to Death. He talked about the, you know, when television arrived and people started saying, oh, it'll be a great tool for educating children. Now we can keep them, you know, entertained and, and show them various things as we're educating them. And he said, well, what has been the real result of that? You look at something like Sesame Street. Sesame mm -hmm. Street doesn't teach children to love learning. It teaches children to love television. <laughs> and I think, I think that kind of hits the nail on the head. It's only certain things can be portrayed or or conveyed via this medium. Mm -hmm. So that's all you talk about. That's the way you portray it. But how do you how do you show on television someone someone deliberating, someone thinking about th something and going, well, mm -hmm. it could be this or it could be that. I mean, you can have talk shows where people, you know, are talking and debating, but even that is limited by, you know, two minutes and then you got to cut to commercial mm -hmm. break and you got to have some drama. And so people have to be shouting at each other. How do you how do you present various aspects of the human experience that can't be condensed down into that medium? You can't. So and then we start to see that experience and see what's see the TV world and then start to emulate that world. So in a way, we're creating a vision of a world that doesn't exactly exist. It's it's this TV fake reality that we then start bringing into real reality because it's all we've ever seen. Mm -hmm. It's hard to to allow a human to go through the discovery process when someone basically discovers it for you and puts it in front of you, just watching my two-year-old develop over the last couple of years, it's not just learning. It's not just that she gets that there's two shoes and one fits each foot correctly, but the process of of like putting the actual shoe on and feeling that it hurts when it, when this one's on that foot and, or, or like learning, she used to think that every, she calls everything a bee, every insect is a bee. And she used to love touching every insect and then she got stung and she, and she learned through that process, very different than just watching a TV where it's like, oh, I mean, how do you present that? How do you present the sting and the, the itch and the pain? And, and then, you know, now she wants to kill every insect in sight. It's fascinating to watch how she's just turned on insects. But, um, but I, but I've seen just that process. And I used to wonder too, when I was in high school, I had to go to the library. I had to go through the process of like looking, looking in the catalog, where is the book that I need to pull the book out. And even like you said, that's different than somebody who thousands of years ago would listen to somebody talking versus pulling the book out. And yeah, how does that shape all of us? I wanted to ask you about that related to you discussed the nation state, the rise of the nation state, how media uh, allowed us to, I guess, I don't know if the words coagulate or group together, and 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 then uh, how does that turn into this uh, contentious term globalization, which I have mm. people yeah. discuss. And but 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 first. If you're going to be sitting watching the media matrix, you got to have a great glass of wine because it's it's a deep thinking, robust, philosophically based history that uh, just I don't know, just it's it's robust, just like my wine. So go to AllisonWinePromo.com, get yourself some high altitude Malbec. Uh, these are all from Argentina. The Rogue Malbec. I, come on. Does anything describe James Corbett better than Rogue? So go get the Rogue Malbec in honor of James Corbett or get one from 9,000 feet. 
and uh, support my work. You get 50% off the wine itself and 50% off shipping. You can also go to TwinEngineCoffee.com. You get 10% off your first order. These are USDA certified organic roasts. They're high altitude. Small business. Uh, all operation is in Nicaragua. These are great coffees. There's light roast. There's dark roast. There's a Katura tea, which is tea made from the coffee fruit. I forgot to change over to TwinEngineCoffee.com slash Allison for the banner. And uh, I like to cold brew mine 24 hours. It's very good for the summer. So whether you like tea, coffee, or wine, go uh, go check out my sponsors. They help keep me in business. And uh, let's get back to James. Okay, he's so nice. He'll even sit through the promos. Um, okay, so yeah, let's talk. Let's talk about. You're the a pro, movie. by the way. That was I'm very, a pro. Very well done. Oh, uh, that wasn't even my best one. Um, <laughs> I'll have to send you some of my best ad reads. Then you could tell me how that's shaped me. Uh, how, how having sponsors shapes shapes my media, but let's talk about the nation state. Yeah. So ha- so where where in the history of media does that come in? Is it with the printed word? Because uh, I that's I remember learning about it when I was watching your Gutenberg yeah. series, and then and then how does how does the media we're dealing with today affect the term globalization, and what does that what does that mean? So and what's yeah. the difference, I guess, between okay. the nation state and a globalized world. Right. Excellent. Excellent questions. And um, actually, first of all, let me just say, yes, this is this is a real bookshelf where, you know, these are I, I have real texts here. See, I have to say that because last time I was on I, the, when you interviewed me, y- uh, you made some statement about me waiting in the green room. And someone oh, took yeah. that quite literally as if, uh, is that a green screen behind you, James? I thought it was a real bookshelf. <laughs> yeah. No, this is not a green screen. This is a real but room. Couldn't you be deep fact... faking us right now? I mean, couldn't you be pulling fake books out and deep faking uh, us? You know, like, how good do we point. Know Maybe sure. that's all being done in post, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But, I believe you. But that actually speaks to something, doesn't it? That the people can't even fathom you know i'm actually a real person in a real room you know like yeah. no this all green screen it can't be don't, anyway don't i just for, think don't let me forget to pitch this question your way i, I want you to stay on the nation state and globalization mm-hmm. but i i can't remember who it was who was on rogan and made a point that when there's no truth when people get to the point where they're so skeptical of the the possibility you could ever even know something is real that all that matters at that point is power because mm-hmm. you you can't have discussions based on on truth anymore. Yeah. So so whoever wields the heaviest stick, we're like back to where we were, you know, thousands of years ago now. Yeah. Um, and you know, I want an incredibly I important that point. Flag incredibly that for you. important. Okay, uh, nation state first. So I okay. uh, just got my copy of Understanding Media, Marshall McLuhan, um, who wrote about this at length. He says uh, of the many unforeseen consequences of typography, the emergence of nationalism is perhaps the most familiar. Political unification of populations by means of vernacular and language groupings was unthinkable before printing uh, turned each vernacular into an extensive mass medium. The tribe, an extended form of a family of blood relatives, is exploded by print and is replaced by an association of men homogeneous, homogeneous, <laughs> homogeneously, homogeneously trained to be individuals. Nationalism itself came as an intense new visual image of group destiny and status and depended on a speed of information movement unknown before printing. Today, nationalism as an image still depends on the press, but has all the electric media against it. Hmm. In business, as in politics, the effect of even jet plane speeds is to render the old national groupings of social organization quite unworkable. In the Renaissance, it was the speed of print and the ensuing market and commercial developments that made nationalism, which is continuity and competition in homogeneous space, as natural as it was new. By the same token, the the heterogeneities and non-competitive discontinuities of medieval guilds and family organization had become a great nuisance as a speed up of information by print called for more fragmentation and uniformity of function. So you, you'll forgive me for not having quoted this passage in the Gutenberg Conspiracy where I talked about this, but it's some pretty heady philosophical stuff. But I think the underlying point is there. There, there was no way to really connect with a broader grouping than the tribal basis, the sort of the village that you lived and grew up in before print made this incredible hetero- homogeneity of ver- the vernacular of of language itself suddenly well at the very least we're a people who speak the same tongue 
And that can all be rendered into print and then disseminated over this geographical area much more quickly than word of mouth could possibly do. And to bring those people together into some sense of, okay, we are a people, we are a nation. And well, now a nation state can come into existence. So before that point, you had monarchs obviously reigning over the space that they they claimed as their geographical territory, but there was no sense that this was a nation state. It was just, we are all subjects of the king. But like now suddenly you have this idea. Team. Like we're not gonna have a soccer team or something uh, based on- Yeah, that. yeah, exactly. So now you have this, this, this possibility of starting to think about it. But as he says, the electronic, the electric media, radio and television start to explode that because now it, it accelerates the process well beyond, now we're beyond sort of nations. Now we're into the global reach of things. And he talks about this in his introduction. After 3000 years of explosion by means of fragmentary and mechanical technologies, the Western world is imploding. During the mechanical ages, we had extended our bodies in space. Today, after more than a century of electric technology, we have extended our central nervous system itself in a global embrace, abolishing both space and time as far as our planet is concerned. Rapidly, we approach the final phase of the extensions of man, the technological simulation of consciousness, when the creative process of knowing will be collectively and corporately extended to the whole of human society, much as, as we have already extended our senses and our nerves by the various media. Whether the extension of consciousness, so long sought by advertisers for specific products, will be <laughs> a good thing is a question that admits of a wide solution. Um, fascinating stuff. He, I think he, uh, he was writing this in the 1960s. And wow. I think he's bang on about what's happening in the 2020s and beyond as we approach the metaverse and the the full on electronic simulation of consciousness, the 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 sub subsuming our identities in this electronic embrace that extends across the globe, abolishes space and time. We can interact with anyone anywhere mm -hmm. uh, in any language. It'll uh, auto translate for us and all of this. We are starting to get that sense. So that starts to erode that nation state idea into now we're all humanity. It's a global embrace. And as mm. he says, what that means, well, that's a problem that admits a wide variety of solutions. We don't know yet, but it certainly is fundamentally transforming the nature of humanity itself. And yet I constantly hear how, though we have all of these means of connecting, like you're talking about, I could be friends with somebody halfway across the world. Uh, more and more, uh, there are researchers coming out publicly talking about the negative effects of these media on our experience as humans, um, mm -hmm. depression and isolation. And so is it like really living, I guess, what does that even mean to have a, mm -hmm. what is a relationship? I mean, what, you know, on one hand, I guess I can see the value of being able to keep up with friends. Uh, but I think... I, I don't know. There's just something so different about going on a walk with a friend or doing something that you create an actual object together. Like you're, you're, you're working on your garden and you, you have a bean plant and you can eat it together. You like some, something like that versus yeah. just checking in on Facebook where uh, I don't know, it just it, it, that in and of itself is obviously very curated, but even if yeah. you're communicating through that yeah. medium, is that even the same? Um, Cause it just yeah. seems like it's let us down in a lot of ways incredibly important point that goes towards where we where we were really taking this because you raise a point that in a certain sense is obvious to everyone i mean it's certainly when you're reading printed page you know you're not getting the smell you're mm -hmm. not getting the taste you're not getting the sight you're not getting anything really except what you generate in your mind mm -hmm. um when you move to radio suddenly at least okay you've got audio you can hear what is happening the rest you have to generate in your mind with tv now you've got the video and the audio so now you can start to sort of put yourself in that picture but you know you're not getting it you don't get the smells or the taste so we can have this conversation electronically and i'm not looking at you allison i'm looking at my webcam because i know if i look at you i'm not going to look like i'm looking at you right right so right. there's all these things that, that go in, in on this and I, we're not in the same room you, you can read my body language a little bit, but not completely. And you don't know, you can't pick up on the subtle clues of communication that are mm -hmm. part of the human experience that perhaps 
are we losing those particular cues and those, the ability mm -hmm. to read nuance and, and sort mm -hmm. of the contextual clues because so little of our lives is actually spent in real life space at this point. And where does that go from here? So our solution to this, rather than to sort of put the brakes on this or say, hey, what's going on? Or maybe just sort of consciously think about these and start to make the conscious adjustments. Okay, I'm in a mediated conversation here. It's not a real conversation. No, no, no. Our solution to this is to go, well, we just haven't immersed ourselves enough, enough in this yeah. media. So now instead of just the audio and the video and that, no, now we're going to strap on the metaverse goggles. Right. We're going to be in this 3D world where we can, Allison, we can go for a walk and we can share a meal together and we can do these things in this media space that we're sharing. And we can have the the whatever they call it, the haptic sensors and things that will give us the tactile feedback. I can touch you on the shoulder and I can feel your shoulder and all of these things. We can simulate all of this experience. Well, who needs the real world anymore? We can just st strap ourselves directly into the media. And that raises uh, the specter of a different philosopher who I do talk about in my online course, Baudrillard, Jean Baudrillard, who wrote about simulacra and simulation. And the idea that the real, whatever that is, is perhaps ultimately unattainable, but certainly is becoming more and more and more blurred as more and more we are creating copies of reality within a system of mediated experience that we then take for reality and start modeling the world after. And in his book on uh, simulacra and simulation, he writes about Disney World as being one of the great examples of this. Dis what is Disney World? It is a real space that has been created to bring into reality the fake space of Walt Disney's Imaginarium. But then you could take that a step backwards because, well, Walt Disney was working from templates of reality, right? Like castles and things that are part of our, our imagination. So he was bringing that into the world via cartoons, which then become reality. But even then, when you think of a castle, are you thinking of this particular castle on a hill in Ireland or something? Or are you thinking about the you know storybook castle that you saw illustrated in a book somewhere? Where Where is that line between reality and this mediated simulation of reality? And how do we cross it? This is where it starts to get really, I think, philosophically deep and disturbing. Um, because at, at the end of the day, we start to lose the sense that there is reality anymore. That's that's such a good point. And on the note of deep and disturbing, we're going to go on to some of those topics, but you got to go to either if you want to keep watching live, you're going to have to go to Rumble or Rockfin if you're watching this on YouTube because uh I don't know. We're, I just don't I want James to be able to just spitball. I know he's been very careful, not really. Um but <laughs> but I want I I had a couple questions from locals, which I should say like about depopulation and things like that. And so we're going to get into it. Um if you haven't joined my editorial board over on Locals, go to alisonmorrow.locals.com. If you sign up, you can put questions in ahead of time for people like James. I got a bunch of questions for him. Hopefully, I'll get a few in before he goes. So again, go over to Rockfin or Rumble right now if you want to keep watching live, if you're watching this on YouTube. And everybody should definitely go check out the Corbett Report, uh, corbettreport.com, where you're going to get the Media Matrix series. At, you're releasing, what, one a week, James, right now? That's right. And the third and final part will be next week. Okay, awesome. So everybody go there. Um, thank you for watching on YouTube and we will see you on the other platforms if I can figure out how to do this without cutting everybody off. Okay, let's see here. Remove. All right, bye.